Lounging son. All right, welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and with me today I have another awesome indie cartoonist creator, um, Javier Hernandez. The reason that he's on the show today is to talk about his You Don't Know Ditko uh, zine that he created. I saw it online. I immediately reached, I think like within like an hour of seeing it, I reached out to you, wanted to fucking pick it up, talk to you about it, wanted to get you on the show to kind of elaborate more on, you know, your love of Ditko and, you know, all things Ditko. So welcome to the show, dude. Yeah, Ryan, thanks for having me. It's good to be here on the Comic Lounge, you know. Yeah, we'll just do that. We'll lounge about and talk comics, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's where, that's where the name came from. You know, like, yeah. I was like, fuck, what do I do? There's so many different comic things. And I was like, Comic Lounge. It's a inviting place where you just ch- you chill and talk about comics. You know, whether I'm talking to somebody like yourself, I'm talking to my buddy Dylan or anybody else that's on the show. You know, I just figure it's a it's a relaxed space. You know what I mean? Just talking comics, only spreading positivity. Don't really like to get too much into the negative you know, just sharing the love and passion for comics, dude. And that's kind of what I saw when I saw this Ditko zine. And I'm like, that's dope. You know what I mean? Like, I don't see enough stuff like, and I didn't even know what to expect. I didn't look anything into it of what was in there. I just saw it and I'm like, I'm going to check it out. And I was really surprised, really loved it. And, um, you know, before we get into that, let's, uh, you know, for everybody listening and watching, share a little bit about yourself, you know, kind of your secret origin if you will you know how you got into comics as a fan and how you turned that into something to where you turned your love for that into uh, a cartooning career well that's a good point uh like you said how you turn that love of uh, being a comic fan into a professional because that's usually what happens i mean most people do like comics that's why they pursue it um yeah my name's javier hernandez i'm an independent comics creator or i guess i could just say i'm a comics creator but i work independently i do my own uh I published through my own imprint, Los Comics. Um, I've been doing this, I think, yeah, 23 years. I published my first book in 1998. Uh, it's a title called El Muerto, The Dead One, The Dead Man, however you want to call it. And yeah, I've been self-publishing ever since. Um, now I'm doing graphic novels. You know, now I'll kind of, I don't really disappear, but I'm, you know, I'm basically working on that whole book for mm-hmm. over a year or more. Whereas before I just knock out a 22 page, 32 page comic. Um, but because of social media, thankfully, yeah, always posting, always sharing what I'm working on, showing the process, behind the scenes sketches, uh, just to keep engaged with people. I mean, that's, um, well, social network is such a blessing because I started in 98. Mm -hmm. I think we had MySpace, but we weren't, we weren't really in the mode of like, okay, vote every day, engage, whatever, communicate. Mm -hmm. So it's a great tool now for anybody getting into self-publishing, whether they're web, uh, doing web comics printing up zines, mini comics, or whatever, full-blown full blown graphic novels. So I've been doing that like 23 years. I write and draw my own comics. I, yeah, I'm a cartoonist, I like to call it, where I handle everything, writing and drawing, um, inking, coloring. Sometimes I do my comics in black and white, uh, but I'll do color covers or I'll do the occasional color comic, which takes more time. But yeah, and I'm sure most people are probably familiar with, you know, Photoshop and some of the other programs out there. So I, I still hand draw my comics. Some people call it analog, but I hate that word. Um, I call it traditional. Good. I say traditional. That's that's, yeah, that's how I've, I've worded it. Yeah, because that's the traditional way to draw. You know what I mean? It's like pencil and paper. Because you know? when you say analog, it's like, okay, well, it's the opposite of digital. Like digital is the standard. So, oh, analog. No, yeah. I hand draw it. Um, but like I yeah. said, I use digital for my coloring, for my lettering. Um, yeah, digital, computer, whatever. It's indispensable for production of anything, really. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, besides comics, I teach comics. I teach comic book workshops and uh, classes that I either get hired for schools to do it um, or you know, library programs, museum programs. And I also co-founded my own comic convention uh, 10 years ago. It's our 10th anniversary this weekend, actually. It's called the Latino Comics Expo. And it's the country's first convention dedicated to focusing on Latino comic creators you know, um, Mexican-American, Cuban-American, whatever, mostly based in the U.S. Because obviously there's, you know, in South America, Spain, there's, you know, multitude of cartoonists. But we're focusing on like Latin, Latino-American cartoonists, which is quite a bit, quite quite, quite a few numbers out there increasing every year, which is great. But our show is uh, happening on this week in uh, October uh, 9th and 10th. I'm not sure when this is going to air, but 
that'll be our latest show. It'll be online through the Museum of Latin American Art, um, MOLA, M-O-L-A-A dot org. Uh, readers, listeners can go there and check out the uh, online content. We'll have, a, we'll have the stuff up all weekend, and I'm sure it'll be up for months and months. So, um, yeah, it's been a busy weekend, but, you know, glad to be talking here. And, yeah, like you told everybody, I've done this zine called uh, You Don't Know Ditko, which we'll definitely be talking about. Amongst the many influences I had growing up uh, was comic book creators. And amongst the many is, uh, you know, Jack Kirby, of course, uh, Steve Ditko was one of them. And decided to do a zine based on the man's career. I did the first one a few years ago, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new one I just, you just, uh, we're just talking about. I did a revised version for uh, the Ditko Con, which was being held this last summer in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, Steve Ditko's hometown. There was a whole two month exhibit there at, awesome. the, yeah, at the Bottle Works Museum, uh, two month exhibit dedicated to Steve Ditko. They had original comic pages, they had tons of, you know, uh, copies of his comics and artwork and, his family was involved in it, so there was a lot of childhood artwork. Oh, wow, teenage, that's cool. Yeah, teenage Steve Ditko. Um, uh, I think they called them um, wood carvings or like wood and they draw on the wood or something like that. But his high school art is amazing. Yeah. And his artwork from the army days and his college days. So it was my first trip back east. I'm here in, uh, based in Los Angeles. Um, it was my first trip back east. It was my first trip since the pandemic started, what, a year and a half ago. It was my first convention since, you know, a year and a half ago. So it was like a big, you know, let's just go all out, pack up, fly across the country, and then go to Ditko land. So, yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, Steve Ditko, he's a legend. You know what I mean? I, I know that the last few years of his life, I know he was very, very reclusive. And that's always been kind of how people would talk about him. And it's interesting, too, because, like, I have learned a lot more. I've known that Steve Dicko was a co-creator of, of Spider-Man, right? Like, I've, I've known that, Doctor Strange, all that stuff. Like, that was always, I learned that at a young age, but right. I didn't know about the man, you know? I didn't know about the treatment of him as well in the industry. Like, that was all something that I learned over the past few years, you know, as I, you know, I nerd out on whatever comic book history. Like, that's always something that fascinated me. So, you know, the fact that you did a whole zine just focus on him, you know, and like we lost him, you know, I think it's been like three years now. Yeah, 2018. Yeah, three years. So it's, it's still kind of fresh. To me, it still feels like it was yesterday that I saw it announced that, you know, that he had passed. You did this prior to him passing, right. correct? Yeah, I did a smaller version like this. Um, it was 22 pages. Mm -hmm. um, I did it in 2017, I think. And the reason I did it back then, um, because, you know, at that point, I think Doctor Strange may have come out or was about to come out. And I'm thinking, like, you know, this is a second major character being turned into a film after Spider-Man, which is probably the most, one of the top three famous characters of all time. Right. I go, let me pop this little zine called You Don't Know Dicko, geared more towards, like, the casual fan or definitely the movie fan who doesn't really know anything beyond, like, what you might have said. Like, yeah, I understood he worked on Spider-Man or was the first artist on it and Doctor Strange. But so I wanted to kind of introduce the general public um to this man steve ditko this cartoonist and his career and such so that's why the the thing was called you don't know ditko and um yeah. yeah definitely geared toward a wider audience and then of course the year later he passed away and then um i've been wanting to do an updated version of the zine or a second edition um what happened was i was contacted by uh mark ditko uh steve ditko's nephew who i met a few years ago and he wanted me he was interested because he was helping them organize this uh, exhibit. And he told me that he was looking for something he wanted in the exhibit gift shop that people can buy and take home. Something inexpensive, but something that kind of wraps up the whole story of Steve Dicko. So he said, well, like, your zine will be perfect, right? It's like five bucks, you know, for this little small mini zine. I go, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So he put me in contact with the director of the museum, Matt Lamb. And then I talked to Matt and I told Matt, well, Matt, you know what? If you guys want, you guys, the museum can pay for it. I'll do a new edition of this. This is the original cover from the first one, but all I did, I put like along the top, uh, it says Hometown Heroes, Steve Ditko exclusive. And I put their Bottle Works logo on here. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you can make like a special exclusive edition. So they bought a uh, whole ton of those and they had them in the gift shop selling them during the exhibit. And then um, 
they invited me to come out there to the, uh, they had a Dick Cocon, like the last day of the exhibit and his little mini convention. Um, there was other artists and writers there and I was on a panel. So, and then I told them that I was gonna be doing a deluxe edition that probably be out right after the show. That's what this is. It's expanded, like it's got an additional 22 pages. So it's like 44, 46 pages, something like that. Yeah. Um, so that's one, it's, it's in my web shop too. We can put that up later. Yeah, definitely. Definitely after we're done recording, I want all the, send me all the links and I'm going to drop it in the, the thing. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just think it's a zine like this, you know, like for the most part, I think of it, it's like, it's going to be comics, right? Um, but I have, I, like, every time I see something like this, where it's unique to, it's, it's its own thing. It doesn't, it can have comics in it. It can have interviews. It can have articles and all that stuff. Like, it just makes me like, it, it gives me that itch where like I want to go produce it, you know, like that's yeah. definitely what I got from this. Like it just made me so excited to like, I just got to do it. You know, I just got to do something because I love comics and I, there's all sorts of ideas that I've had, you know, forever, you know, like that I just want to put into practice. And I think that you really, the type of content you put in here, whether it's covers or it's interviews or it's, you know, a comic book that you drew or, you know, just a timeline, all, all sorts of stuff that you included in here. I think it is the perfect, like, primer to Dicko. Right. You know, it really is. And thanks. why Dicko, though? Like, I, I know you said, like, the, you know, the movie's coming out. And I know you said he is one of your influences. But of all your influences, you decided to do Steve Dicko. What about him and his life really just, like, you're like, you know what? I got to do this. I have to get this done. I have to put this out in the world. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, well, I'll just, the, the easy answer part of it would be, well, there's already that Jack Kirby collector that's been like, what, 15, 20 years of that yeah, great that's... Jack Kirby fan magazine. Now it's a, pro, a professional magazine dedicated to Kirby. So I figure, okay, they got Kirby covered really good. They do it every couple of months, you know. But with Ditko, yeah, he's one of my favorites. He's always been one of my favorites. I mean, him and Kirby are really the top two for me because he's such an interesting individual and there's just so many misconceptions about him. You know, a lot of it was because famously, you know, it's cliche, Dicko wouldn't do interviews. He would always turn him down, whether you call him up, knock on his door at his apartment or uh, send him letters, like no interviews. He just didn't, you know, it just wasn't something he wanted to do. Why? He just didn't want to do them. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, so obviously in that vacuum, right, when you're not talking about your work, he wanted the work to speak for itself, which I get that. But, you know, this is, this is a civilization society. Yeah. we talk start talking why why is he reclusive why doesn't he come out of the house blah 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 um he was just private he was a private man and um so i wanted to share some of that but i really wanted to share just about his art why i think he's such a great cartoonist what i love about his character design his storytelling like the emotional oomph he gets in the way he draws the characters and he sets the scene up um and then like you're talking about i have a timeline in there uh, I, I take like a uh, history of his different covers, things like that. Um, and then again, some of it was to, you know, with Spider-Man, Doctor Strange being so prevalent now, I wanted to put a little, um, a different, uh, another, a wider spin on the man. He's not mm -hmm. just about those two characters, which are great. Like again, Spider-Man got to be one of the top three yeah. comic book yeah. icons, yeah. if not just top 10 visual icons on the planet. That says a lot from, yeah. from a very, a man who's very private and wasn't looking into, you know, to being on Johnny Carson and talking about himself and his work. Um, I kind of admire that, you know, like I use social network all the time. I, like we said in the beginning of the show, it's indispensable, but oh, I really yeah. admire that there'd be someone in the world who, you know, everybody would be clamoring for an interview or a video segment from him. And he just wasn't interested in that. And he stuck to his guns. You know, he never jumped on my space when that first came out or all the other ones. You don't got no TikTok. He just does his work and he kept working. That's the other thing I want people to know. He kept working until he passed away. I mean, I have a, behind me a shelf. I have a whole, you know, 32 comics he did. Um, I was thinking that's 28, 26 comics. They were 32 page comics. So we all call them the 32 page series. 32 page comics he did from like 2008 mm -hmm. until whatever. Uh, the last one came out in 2017, 2018 before he passed away. So this is a man who just loved working. He loved telling stories, just bent over there at his drawing board, drawing his comics. And, and as a comic creator myself, I mean, that's like, there's, a, there's your spirit animal. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
I mean, <laughs> was there anything that you learned in doing your research for this, you know, like to make sure that you got facts accurate? Was there anything you learned that kind of, I don't want to say shocked you, but was, was like really memorable to you in terms of like, oh my God, I had no idea about the man that that, that, that happened or something. But I love that question because this might shock people's, not really, because it wasn't, for me, it wasn't really about researching him. I mean, because I figured I knew enough about him. And again, most of it was, I didn't want to like do his, his history. Like he went to the war during these years. He did this in high school. It was just more about my opinions or reflections on his art, his storytelling. The first time I ever saw one of his comics, you know, my recollections of that. Mm -hmm. So it was really just spooling out all my memories but I would fact check certain things. Yeah. When was he born? What, you know, where was he born? You know, where did he go to college? Cause I did have to do that timeline, mm -hmm. but like the other articles, I'm like, I'm talking about his character design. It was just, I would just go pick up the comic and look at, yeah, that's right. Mysterio is designed this way. And I want to talk about why and why squirrel girl looks this way and this and that. So it was really, I just wanted to share like what I knew with everybody else. Um, you know, there's somebody uh, working on a biography of Ditko. He's working with the family. So that's going to be like, okay, you're going to get actual something, you know, authorized or endorsed by the actual family who knew him. Mm. You know, none of us knew him. They knew him from childhood, you know, till he passed. So th that'll be a good thing to look for when that comes out. I was going to say, you know, I didn't know that there was a, a play. <laughs> Dude, yes. Like that, that was something I had no, no idea that that even existed. Can you can you elaborate a little bit more on that for people listening watching that? Yeah, yeah, there was and there's an interview with the direct writer director. Yeah, yeah, it came out in I think 2018, 20, 2017, right before he passed away. I think. Um, yeah, this uh, Ditko fan and this prolific uh, playwright, Lenny Schwartz. I think he's up in Rhode Island. He's written, written a ton of plays, and then he's and again another Ditko fan. He thought one day, you know what? It's time to let the world know what this guy's about. Um, it's actually on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I can send you the link after yeah, so you can share with your audience. Yeah, he wrote a play based on the life of Steve Ditko, and it's um, it's really great because it's one of just like a it's not a one man play, but you know, there's only a few characters in it, and most of it it all takes place on the same stage. Um, and then the guy they cast, at least the version I saw, is like dead ringer for Ditko, a young Ditko. And um, there's a Stan Lee in there. There's a Jack Kirby. There's a Jerry Robinson, who taught Steve Ditko at a I guess during his cartooning uh, college days, um, there's an Ayn Rand in there and then his parents and such. Um, but yeah, I recommend people check that out. So I saw that. I fell in love with the play. I, you know, contacted Lenny, became friends. And I go, I got to put your interview, I got to interview you and put you in the zine because yeah, like you were saying, like it worked. Look, you just found out about the play because of the zine. So my zine's doing its job in that it is putting information out there, good information, I hope that wakes people's eyes like, oh, I didn't know about that. Like, you know, you don't know Dicko's, but it's called. Yeah. So hopefully when you're done reading it, you know a little bit more than you knew uh, coming in, so. Yeah, and then, you know, what, what, where do you stand on, on in terms of creation? So, so many people talk about that particular era of Marvel and how much, how much say maybe a specific writers had and, and right. you know, the creation of the character or how much the artists that were there at the time were really doing more of the heavy lifting. I, I'm not trying to call any names out. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to like no, no. downplay anybody's role in the creation, but I just, it keeps coming up for me. Like I keep hearing about it, I, you know, like different articles and stuff like that. And you see in terms of rights uh, going to certain people, right? right? Like that's being brought up as well. So I, I kind of, Without getting too negative about anything, right, I, just, right, right. I would just love to kind of hear maybe your take on it. You know, you've you've interacted with the family. You know what I mean? Like they're reaching out to you, asking you, "Hey, can this be a part of this, the the Dicko?" Like, so you kind of have that rapport. So I just want to know, in terms of Dicko, and maybe even in terms of Kirby, like where do you think that? What's well, this is good. This is good because yeah, I, I get your I get your um you think you want to keep it positive, so I will and stop. And this might be refreshing because, yeah, I hear different opinions out there from Kirby fans, Dicko fans, Lee fans, and it gets nasty. Um, so I grew up as a kid reading Marvel comics. And, you know, I'd always read the Stan Lee soap. So Stan Lee was a figurehead. Right. Like Stan Lee. Oh, okay, the ringmaster. Hey, 
at Stan's clubhouse because Stan's was always writing to us kids in the bullpen pages, whatever, his soapbox. It was he was using Twitter before there was a Twitter. He was writing to us in his editorials, right? Never mind like the comics that you know he wrote. Mm -hmm. But he was the voice of Marvel for so many of us growing up. Uh, and then I'm sure maybe your age group more like you'd see him on the Spider-Man cartoon, right? He'd narrate like openings for them, I guess. He'd... But I grew up reading him in, uh, in the letters pages. So I was a fan of like your shirt there, Lee, Dicko, and Kirby. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, okay, they created the characters. Um, and then as you get older, you start reading, like, you know, you're saying you start reading more and more and, you know, uh, more, not just like rants of fans, but, you know, more attempts to figure out what's this Marvel method thing. And then I came away with a different perspective as far as like, well, okay, if Stan Lee has the idea for a story, because he's the, the way, here's how I like it. He's the editor, right? He's the one has to report to the boss, the publisher, like, okay, I got to keep these books running. Lee, I mean, Ditko and Kirby and the other guys, they're freelancers. They're just, like, for them, hey, I got to earn money because I got to make a living, support the family. Um, but Stan is the one who has to like run the show. So if he has an idea, and let's say it's just a tiny fragment of an idea, just for the sake of the story. So, okay, he's got this idea for a spider character, and he tells Kirby the idea, and, or Ditko, whatever. And then the way the artists work, and I think it's been well documented without any bias, is they would go home. They wouldn't go home. See, fans don't know. They wouldn't go home with the full script. I'm sure maybe maybe fans would be like, well, I've seen Neil Gaiman scripts or Alan Moore scripts. Yeah like a 10 page script like a movie script you know page one panel one the guy walks across the room picks up the coffee they very detailed i understand a lot of scripts even today i'm sure back then though that's like me telling ryan ryan uh let's do a comic called owl man i see you got owls in the background there uh it's a college kid and uh, he gets hit by lightning bolt and there's an owl next to him and he's got a girlfriend who's always sick and that's all i tell you and then you go home you draw a 20 page comic of owl man and you draw the way he looks and the way his secret identity looks and you do all the interplay with him and his girlfriend and him and his boss, whatever, which I didn't tell you to do that. You did it. You bring it to me. Like, oh, wow. Check all this cool stuff Ryan did. Okay. Well, let me dialogue it. But to me, Ryan created a lot of that stuff. He created like the way they look and the interplay and me, the writer, the dialogue person, you want to call it. Yeah. I put in the cool dialogue, you know, the snappy to dialogue, but me and Ryan created Owl Man. It's not like I created it and he just drew it. He brought all that into it. So that's how I always understood uh, Ditko and Lee, Kirby and Lee, you know, all the other guys that work with, but really all the, you know, the bedrock Marvel concepts were created between those three guys, basically, especially Kirby and Lee with 100 issues of Fantastic Four. Look at the yeah. worst things that came out of there. But um, so that's my understanding of it. It was a co-creation. It's a co-creator status. It's not a, I created it, and then this guy gave him the job to just draw it. It's like, no, we both created it. And yeah. that's just the way I see it. So when I do hear Stanley say there on the Jonathan Ross documentary, the Steve Dicko documentary, Jonathan Ross did, but he says he doesn't believe, he believes he's the sole creator, that's very heartbreaking. And it's, it's ang it angers me, and it makes me sad. Because like Stan, you, you know, it's like, I imagine it's having like a divorced parents, you know, our, my parents are still married, but like you love them both, but you know, you probably somebody wronged the other one. Yeah. So I don't, know if you love, I don't know if you love that person less, but you realize that, but they're still both your parents. Um, so yeah. And, you know, as a comic creator myself, as an artist and a writer, um, that, that's kind of how I work. Like I think of an idea for a concept and I don't write a full script. So then I, I, I give it to my artist side and then, the artist Javier draws the whole comic and then gives it back to the writer Javier and the writer Javier fills in the dialogue based on what the art is already. I mean, it's not the same thing because I'm just one person. So I know everything of what the story should be and how the characters are, but um, I get it. So yeah, I'm just answering your question based on my personal point of view as a cartoonist. And then again, growing up reading these things and then growing up later and then reading a wider scope of it. Um, but yeah, I, I try not to torch Stan because if he had never, if he had never given these guys those assignments, even if they did ninety nine percent of it, if I never told Ryan in, a, in this scenario about Owl Man, he may have never looked behind him and thought of doing an Owl Man based on that painting back there. So yeah. it was my idea, but it was his idea putting it together. So they're co creations. Um, as far as the, uh, yeah, the legal maneuverings, the uh, the copyright. Well, you know, I don't want to. 
I don't want to misspeak on any of that stuff. That's all legal stuff. But, you know, um, the family believes that, you know, the, the copyright laws as they are, the copyright is up on the characters. So if, you know, their uncle or brother had a say in the creation of it, they believe they should get the copyright back. So we let the courts play that out. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the Kirby estate had a, you know, I guess they were happy with the settlement. They had a settlement with Marvel outside of court, a settlement. So, you know, maybe we'll see something like that with the Dicko estate, which would be great. Uh, just a permanent credit. S Steve's thing was always, it's a co-creation. Yeah. He never said, he never said Stanley didn't do anything. Now, there's some er interviews with Kirby. I won't get into all this there. He, where Kirby did say that when he was very angry in the 80s or 90s, an inter interview with Gary Groth of Fanographics. He said right. Stanley did nothing. But I will put that aside because I have respect for, too much respect for Jack. Steve has always said it's a co-creation. Stan says I created it. So which, two, you know, which one do you want to take? Then that's basically what it comes down to. So I think that was without negativity. Yeah, no, you, <laughs> you definitely, you definitely kept it positive. Well, you know, given facts, you know, what I mean, I, I pretty much 100% in line with the way you're, you're thinking about it too. Obviously, you know, you read interviews and like, you said like it makes you sad when you see certain stuff it's like i feel the same way you know i obviously we're from different eras of when we started reading comic books right. so like i maybe i don't have that same affinity or that same connection to those specific creators right right but right. i do love them just the same I, i'm a huge right. kirby fan you know like i wouldn't have this shirt on if i didn't you know i don't just wear it to wear it you know i, no, no. I love that era of marvel i love the entire industry so to see that kind of stuff, it's, it just, it does make me sad sometimes. And, um, you know, I won't get into it either because I don't know the legal shit either, but right. I do hope that the Dicko family is treated properly is all off. That's like my whole, that's my short answer to like what I think about it. If somebody asks me, cause I've been asked a couple of times, Oh, what do you think? I'm, they should be taken care of. And that's, that's as far as I'll, I'll go with it. You know, I have gotten very upset and I've talked about online with, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know if I should call them fans, but you know, commentators online. You know. Oh, I saw that post. I saw that. Post uh, I stand. I stand with Marvel. These guys should have known what they got into when they got into. Like you know, I'm not even going to get into that because yeah. these, these are these are like Mickey. No, no pun intended. These were Mickey Mouse contracts back in the '60s. Yeah. No one thought that. Yeah, this is going to turn to a trillion dollar media empire. So anyway, my my anger, my scorn is held for those type of people who who just who. who who They're dump on the Kirby family? They dump on the Dicko family. They did this with the Kirby family back in the day. Like, oh, they're just a bunch of, you know, money grubbing low lives. Time to get a job. It's like, wow. And I want to, yeah, I want to even respond to that now. It's just so. It's good. And I would have done this for the Dicko family anyway, like defend their position. But having met them, no, these are these are professional people. They're not. They have been sitting around for decades waiting for yeah. the Marvel yeah. handout. That is this is dumb. So anyway. Yeah, just no. formed opinions. Yeah, I mean, I feel that's. A, I know when I saw that post that you did, I just that kind of got me a little heated too, thinking about that because it's, the corporations are just fine. You know what I yes. mean? They are yeah. doing just fine in their whatever houses they're living in, whatever money they're making. <laughs> yeah. You know, they can take care. They can fix something that was a glaring mistake in the past. Is how I look at it. It's much like Siegel and Schuster. When Neil Adams was advocating for for the right for them to get some sort of monetary rights, like these are the guys that created Superman, sold it as seventeen year olds for nothing, right. and then we're watching this company just make. Well, I, I don't I, I don't know the exact number from back then because that was years ago, but right. you know they're making a lot of money, millions nowadays, right? Millions, maybe billions, I don't know, but you know you you should take care of them. You know what I mean? Like you should, they should get credit. You, they shouldn't be living. I don't want living like check to check or whatever they were living on, you know, back then it's, and I, I just think it's, it's time for, like you said, Mickey Mouse contracts. It's time for them to like, <laughs> it's time for them to like kind of fix that because these people and, you know, and the family of these creators, they, they do deserve it because they, I feel like Ditko and Kirby, were wrong. I feel like Siegel and Schuster were wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like they should have had some monetary thing, especially when you, and I'm not, this isn't me shitting on Stan Lee, right. but I mean, look at what he, look at what he got. Cause he was the figurehead, right? Like he was taken care yeah. of by Marvel. 
Marvel gave him a lifetime contract. He, in fact, I, I think at one point in the you know the two thousands whatever he's still there, um, still alive. He had sued Marvel, I think, because they weren't honoring the contract. Like, I, to me, I it like, know. It was like the secret contract he had where he was supposed to get 10% off every movie media thing. I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. Again, that was like, oh, did Jack yeah. and Steve get that? But whatever. But yeah. this goes on today even. I mean, I'm sure you can, I'm not saying anything secret. It's, it's all over internet, Facebook. Ed Brubaker, right? The writer who uh, created uh, Winter Soldier. Yeah. So there's the was uh, Falcon and, and the what is it Falcon and Winter Soldier TV show? Yeah, he said he's. His, I'm not telling you a secret. He posted. He's like, yeah, I didn't get anything out of that. I got a thank you at the end. He said he got more money from his cameo in the Captain America movie yeah. from the Screen Actors Guild because you know once you act in it, you get a you get a residual. That's ridiculous that he gets more residual money from his little silent appearance in whatever Captain America film he was in than yeah. he gets for. This character he came up with um, that's this huge movie and me media icon now, uh, Winter Soldier. I think that people, <laughs> I think that the reason that some people fight against that though is because their argument, and I kind of see it, I do think he should get some credit, you know what I mean? But he didn't create Bucky Barnes, Joe right. Simon and Jack Kirby did. So he right. changed the concept a little bit, right. you know what I mean? Like he redid the character. And I've seen also people argue, and well, you should have just created a new character. But even then, Marvel wasn't giving those type of contracts where you got, I, I mean, like, it's not like the 90s where if you created a character like Rob Liefeld, the Deadpool, and Cable and Xbox, he still gets money from that because, of the, type, yeah. because of the type of contracts they had back then. They're not giving those out now. <laughs> DC and no, Marvel's no, no. not giving those kind of contracts. No, but it's a good point you said about Winter Soldier and Bucky, but let's just take another one. Let's take Thanos. Jim Sterling, yeah. Thanos has been the center point of their billion dollar entire Avengers storyline that's yeah. driven that whole, whole, you know, I don't know, 10 movies maybe. He, he said he wasn't rolling in residual money either because the contracts weren't written back then. So, what, yeah, what I'm saying is, yeah, the contracts weren't, but it's up to these companies. You got to do right. Yeah. You guys cannot have Thanos uh, in Finley Gotland drinking cups at Disneyland. It's like a have you seen them? I've seen them. They're rolling the money. Cool. <laughs> and like the guy, yeah, I, I want to get one, but I never got. Yeah. But you know, someone came up with that idea back in the 70s when no one thought anything of these characters. So um, yeah, I mean, things that the people should be taking care of morally. Just it's just a moral argument. Maybe it's not a legal one. Maybe they don't win the legal argument because all oh, the contract, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But um, I, although I will having said that, I do say. Like, I'm kind of less, this is going to sound very harsh, knowing what we know, right? You and me know it. A lot of your listeners know it. Mm -hmm. Knowing what we know, the, how the contracts are written, they're not written for you to get residuals out of your characters. Like the Deadpool, that's over with. That was done. That yeah. was a, so when you go want to work for DC and Marvel, you're dying to work for them. I mean, and you create a character and it comes out to in a movie in 10 years, or, and I hear you on Facebook complain about it. It's going to sound harsh, but I'm going to be less sympathetic because we all know now. Yes. Like starting today. Yes. Let's just say right now in October 2021, this is the cutoff point. Okay. We all know. So beware. Buy or not buy, sell or beware because you're selling your ideas oh. once you. I know it's attractive to work for those two companies, particularly Marvel, right? You know, I want my aunt to know I work for Marvel, but be careful, okay? Yeah, I mean, we've learned from these other people. Take your creations and go create them yourself. That's, you know, like that's, I, I would rather see somebody just do their own thing. Like, I love indie comics, I love indie creators. I, I mean, I, that's one of my main goals with my channel is to spotlight people that aren't getting the spotlight, self publishing, not just indie in terms of like image or, you know, dark horse or stuff like that. I, I want to get the self published people like yourself, and there's a whole Great slew. Role. Create your own. Yeah. Exactly, dude. Like that's what that's what people should be doing. Like learn I, the lesson of the past. That's the lesson you should learn. Look at what the image guys did. Look at what Robert Kirkman did. You know what I mean? He didn't create for Marvel and DC. He left them and decided I'm doing my own thing. And I think that that is a good lesson in terms of what people can maybe Maybe your creation doesn't become a TV show or a billion dollar movie, but you own it and that's yours and nobody can take it from you, you know? Oh, you don't got to tell me that, but I, I, yeah. I get the attraction. Like, 
yeah, but I want my character on the big screen with, you know, Captain America and Thor. It's like, well, okay, but it's not going to be your character when it's up there. Yeah, you don't know. Yeah, you created it, and you'll get you'll get a nice thank you at the at the in end the, of the credit in, roll. In the fine print, yeah. <laughs> really, really yeah like, like after the caterer and all that, after the, the guy who controls the pets, the dogs, whatever. Yeah. Whatever, I mean, you know, so, but the people in the past, when these uh, comic companies were just little Mickey Mouse, little, you know, fly-by-night companies, and yeah, there's got to be some type of uh, recipe. By the way, then here's another thing about fans on the. It's not just like, oh, give the family a big chunk of money. You know, these artists, Kirby, Dicko, they have legacies. They have estates. They have things that have to be. Their legacy gets uh, stays active by, but maybe there's museum shows. Maybe there's a little museum dedicated to that person. Maybe there's artwork and prints made of, of their creator-owned work. That costs money, you know? Mm -hmm. So the estates, the families that we want to call it, whoever's in charge of the estate of whatever artist, they have to fund that type of stuff. You know, there's a Frankfurt Zeta Museum. Right. You know, that's an estate. It's not, yeah, so these idiots just saying, oh, they just want money. It's like, there's money needs to be there to run these estates, to keep this their and their independent creator own stuff running and continuing and and whatever so yeah i mean i i'm right there with you you know i i'm exactly you you are you said exactly how i feel and i'm not a creator you know but if i was to create something i would rather create for myself yes marvel and dc what? marvel and dc don't get me wrong like to be able to say that you wrote or you drew a marvel or dc right, comic, right, right. of course did every every six year old, seven year old in you wants wanted that right? As a kid, you wanted to do that. But growing up and watching this stuff, I would rather create my own thing and just you know have the control and do what I want. And um, yeah, I think that that's the exciting thing about you know indie indie and self creator or I mean self publishing creator own stuff is that it's really like a punk rock way of doing it. You yeah. own that shit, and like that's how we get awesome projects like this you know into the world and you know i, I want to bring it back to more, more positive stuff too. oh go ahead well really quick uh, the, another big lesson i get from dicko is so he did self-publish or he he had a friend robin snyder who was an editor with him on a couple of projects in the, i think the 80s so robin snyder goes hey let me set up a publishing imprint and we'll just publish your work steve so Steve based Steve Dicko basically self-published for about 35 years with through Robin Snyder, Snyder Dicko publishing. So he went the independent route. Like I said, mm -hmm. I got a ton of books from them, and it's all creator-owned stuff. He did the mocker, static, um, all these other characters he did in the last 10 years. So he went the self-publishing route. Can you imagine being a self-publisher? Like, oh yeah, I created Spider-Man too, by the way, back in the day. But yeah. now I'm doing the black and white, uh self-published small little small run books <laughs> yeah i mean it's awesome dude and it's cool i didn't you know i know i i think i feel like i've seen them on kickstarter right i mean that's where yeah. robin Snyder. i think there's something new right now as a matter of fact that she just put up so yeah. i'll drop the link down there for for everybody listening and watching for that as well um before we you know kind of wrap this up i do want to ask like what's your what's your favorite of dicko's work oh wow favorite yeah favorite we're favorite. asked that on the panel uh I mean, I always want to, I jump to the answer right away, and it's true, uh, Spider-Man. Okay. You know, I just love, I still love looking at those and reading those, and yeah, he just captured a certain style with that, especially the earliest issues. They're kind of, I don't know if crude is the word, but they're a little, I don't know, they're kind of rough looking, kind of punk looking, and yeah, I love yeah. that. Same. You know, um, the stories are great, the villain, his character designs are phenomenal, mm -hmm. whether it's like a little scared old ant or a sickly little teenager, or the Roy Orbison looking Doc Ock, you know, just a bunch of weirdos, the villains that, you know, he drew. And um, so that's a favorite of mine. I love his 1970s uh, Charlton comics. Yeah, the he questions. A lot of horror, yeah, horror, ghost, mystery stories. Um, mm. I love his last 10 years. I love those independent books. You know, the line work is a little different. It's a, maybe more sparse, but it's still got that. You can still tell it's a Dicko drawing, the figures. They still have that Dicko look about them. Mm -hmm. um and just the way he tells his stories so but spider-man is always my first answer i mean to this it might be a cliche but no i look at it i go yeah i just can't get over that stuff yeah same i mean i'm a huge spider-man fan and then i think right after that as much as i like dr strange i think the question 
Um, for some reason, good. that question or the question character has always been one of my favorites. I can't even really like understand why. I mean, there's no face, but it just there's just something about that character that has always yeah. appealed to me. Even going into like what Danny O'Neill and Dennis Cowan did in the '80s with that right. series. Um, but yeah, Spider Man would be my number one also. Um, so before and then before I let you go. I was wondering if you could kind of share a little bit about your other projects real quick, where we can find them, where we can purchase them, and um, also, what do you have next in, in the works? Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess the biggest thing I have, you know, for a while is the, my first El Muerto graphic novel, Days of the Dead, which is in my web shop. You can also get it off from Amazon. Those of you just like the convenience of clicking on Amazon, look up Javier Hernandez, Days of the Dead. That's the first El Muerto graphic novel. I'm working on the second one. My plan is to do, and don't ever do this, <laughs> do this when you're 30s and 40s, but I plan to do 10 graphic novels of El Muerto. So I'm on book number two right now working on that. Okay. And then the book, book number three follows and blah, blah, blah. And let's get to hopefully number 10. Um, so I like the idea of doing like a thousand page epic, like Stan Sakai with Saga Yojimbo, or I mean, just name, name like a certain cartoonist who's done a huge run. Mm -hmm. the Japanese artist I mean you know oh, yeah. tens of thousands of pages I'll never get that far but um so yeah I'm, I'm dedicated to this character El Muerto telling his story his cast his cast his uh trials and tribulations and such um besides that like I said I teach I teach comic book workshops um I'm working with the school down in Escondido right now the kids are working on human rights so they, they, they each pick a human right that they want to focus on and I'm going to show them how to turn that into a comic story so that's a really nice worthwhile cause. And um, what else do I do? And I'm working on the, uh, like I said, we're finishing up our last, not our last one, my last Latino Comics Expo. I'm actually retiring after this show. I told my partners that 10 years has been a good run, but I got to focus on my books. Because every time, every every fall when we get gear up to do a new show, it takes so much time. Mm -hmm. It takes so much time that you have to focus on it and do it right. But I go, I can no longer afford the time. You know, I really got to get these books going and such. So. Um, and 10 years is a good number, I think, running the show. Mm -hmm. So my partners in there, they'll, they'll be able to take over and, and do it from there. So basically, uh, oh, this month, uh, all of the month of October, I did my own spin on Inktober. Oh, yeah, uh, it's yeah. called uh, Dick, Dick Cober, right? Dick Co, B-E-R, Dick Cober. Mm -hmm. um, so fans can find me on my social networks, uh, Instagram, whatever. Ryan will have the links down below. Um, yeah, every day there's a different prompt. You can find it on my Instagram the prompt sheet um in fact after this i'm gonna have to get working on day number seven or eight whatever it is uh the creeper <laughs> nice and put that up so all right cool man well thank you so much for you know taking time to chat comics steve ditko with me of course uh this is an awesome chat and i definitely would love to do this with you again sometime in the future talk about your you know your own creation uh once i can pick up a couple of those um and thank you yeah again thank you so much dude and i can't wait to talk again yeah thank you ryan and thank you uh listeners <laughs>